Um, for today's podcast episode, we decided to watch the films Percy Jackson and the Olympians. And I can warm us up with a little personal trauma story. I know you know this story, but I don't know if I've, I don't remember if I told it on the podcast or not. So it might be a repeat. But my experience with the Percy Jackson movies was I actually read the books because of an ex boyfriend who had ADHD. And um, he was like, you love mythology, you're in line class, this feels perfect for you, which it was. It was a great recommendation. He had great taste in books. Um, but yeah, like when we broke up, he had done the whole routine, our whole relationship of when we break up, we're still gonna be friends and you're still going to like want to mess around with me and stuff, which I don't know why guys say that. That's like okay. so stupid. But um, he was like, we're still gonna be friends. So my thought was like the Percy Jackson and the Olympians movie was coming out and I'm like, okay, I can I can start off our friendship portion of our relationship well by inviting him to Percy Jackson and the Olympians and saying, you know, there's no hard feelings over this breakup. Let's watch this movie of this thing we enjoy together. Mm -hmm. I got ghosted. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so it took me a long time to actually watch the movies myself, and um, I don't think I had ever fully gotten through it until we started doing this podcast. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. And yeah. for for me, um, <laughs> for me, like the movies are so weird because they're why I watched the like why I read the books at all. Like Ooh. I can remember in like 2010 seeing people on Twitter talking about the trailer and hating it who like already had read the books and because by then the first five books had all come out but I had never heard of it and I was like 25 then and I went to the bookstore and I saw that it was on like the shelf or whatever of like books being turned into movies and I was like oh right I should read this I might like it and then I was almost late to work that day <laughs> because I liked it so much and I went back like the next day to buy like the second book because I was like wow this is really good and I'm like so it's like weird that I read the books because of the movies but the movies are like offensive <laughs> yeah. and so it's just hilarious to me that without the movies I don't know if I would have read them at all it would have taken me a lot longer to like get around to reading them or heard about even them at all, I think. Yeah. So it's like, I don't know, maybe them or heard about even them at all, I think. Yeah. And so it's like, I don't know, maybe it's better <laughs> that we ended up with the movies being so horrible and we ended up here in the end instead of like, I don't know. I feel like we've won out of, when I think about all the different YA things that were going on back then, like Divergent and even Harry Potter. I feel like we've, like, yeah, we finally, we've like kind of come out like looking the best just by existing longer <laughs> and like waiting until like, we almost like waited everyone out for like time to pass for everyone to realize that all the other ones kind of suck. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, and I mean, I've, I was talking about this with somebody that's like still a big Harry Potter fan because she doesn't pay attention to fandom or JK Rowling. Mm -hmm. And so she's still like a very pure fan. And I was talking about the love to hate aspect of YA culture from back then. And she was just like, I'm still just a fan. I don't get it. So like millennials are kind of, some of us are processing our own trauma with stuff like this. And some of mm -hmm. us are fully like, no, I'm still team Edward. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think yeah. it's it's just, I don't even know what to say. It's weird that these movies have Rick Riordan li listed as a writer. And I know that's because it's just literally like his thing mm -hmm. they took, but he hates it more than anyone else. Yeah. So. <laughs> Yeah, so um, to start us off, I'll, I'll say what I said to you, because I think it sums up the movie so well, is that was also the era where they were doing all of the parody movies, you know, like Scary Movie 1, Scary Movie 2, Not Another Teen Movie, um, the type of movies that were supposed to be poking fun at specific genres. Mm -hmm. And Percy Jackson and the Olympian movies almost feels like that, but for YA fiction. Um, because it seems like they they went so overboard with making sure Logan Lerman was funny and making sure I forgot what the actor's name is who plays Grover, but making sure that he hit some of those lines. Yeah, yeah. It's just like this. 
this is like it, it sort of Percy Jackson, but it's not. It's a little too humorous. Mm -hmm. um, I do think that the TV show has done a better job of capturing the humor and the levity of the series while still, you know, like maintaining some of the heaviness and darkness that's in it. Yeah, I don't even I I said this to you before we did this, but I feel like they took the movie and they took like the name Percy Jackson mm -hmm. and they were this happens sometimes with movies where a director wants to make like a certain kind of movie like their idea mm -hmm. but for whatever reason they can't get anyone to let them make their movie and so sometimes they'll like take a movie that already is known through something else and be like oh we're adapting this but then like they're really not they're literally just like finding a way to make their movie yeah and they make their movie and then that's the end of that because i feel like that's what it's so weird that what's his face did this movie uh christopher whatever who directed the first two harry potter movies too is the same director is it and, or is that somebody else i think his name is christopher columbus but i'm like am i remembering that right yeah <laughs> like that his name is actually christopher columbus no christopher reeve is superman yeah <laughs> yeah I, like i don't want to call him christopher columbus if that's not really his name because that's kind of offensive at this point but i think that's his, actually his name but like the first two harry potter movies it's so weird because the first two harry potter movies are like boring because they literally are like copy pasted onto the screen and they have all of these things in them that don't make any sense because they're just there because they're in the books yeah. like if i want to be mean about it i could even include Ginny in that <laughs> that she's in the she's in those in those movies especially the first movie yeah like we don't need there. that little scene yeah like she's just kind of there or like there's so many things like just like the ghosts alone really they're just kind of there and it, there isn't really necessarily a point to them. They're just kind of there because they're because you want you know that the fans want to see that. Mm -hmm. And so it's so weird that he did that with the first two Harry Potter movies, where those are like very nostalgia y, but they're not actually good movies at all. And then he went the completely other direction with these movies, where he was like, actually, I'm gonna make nothing be the same. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> nothing is going to be the same nothing's going to be accurate and i'm going to turn this thing into something else that doesn't resemble it at all that sounds, well, sounds fun it's gonna feel wild because i know we're gonna eventually watch sea of monsters for this podcast too but sea of monsters is worse like yeah and like when you see sea of monsters lightning thief doesn't seem as bad like on how much it diverged from the actual books but yeah I like i know that sea of monsters is worse because that's why i never watched it i i i, I never even tried to watch that one mm -hmm. because i knew that it was worse i saw like tyson and and i was just like what the fuck is going on why is tyson like like a stoner rastafarian dude from like that one guy in clueless that one character in clueless oh my gosh yeah <laughs> that's what i feel like he was supposed to be and i was like this feels i remember even back then i was just like it feels really weird that you take a character like tyson and turn him into somebody like that um yeah. that's not him at all and so just that alone and then i also heard that they like somehow for god knows what reasons like set up percy and clarice in those movies yeah. as like something romantic and i was like that's weird that's so weird that's so strange. And so I never even tried to yeah. watch those movies, that movie, especially because all I remembered about the first one was that it wasn't good at all. And once I like read the books and then watched the movie, I was like, yeah, this is really not good. <laughs> like, no wonder. I remember at the time that the way that Rick Riordan put it was that he wanted to, what am I trying to say? He the like idea like the characters of Percy Jackson and stuff like if you think about it the last the last Olympian came out in 2010 right with the year which is the year that this movie came out and so when they started making the movie and like getting ready for it probably in like 2008 or something 
um, the books weren't even like done yet. Like 2008 was when like the, I think the Titans curse came out that year or maybe that was the year. I don't remember. Anyway, he was still in the middle of publishing them all. And so he said back then, um, Oh, that was weird. (laughs) I don't know. But he said back then that he was, what am I trying to say? That, That like the characters were too personal to him. And that like, so he couldn't, he wasn't involved at all with like the people that were making it into a movie because he just, it was like too personal of a story to him because it was based off of, you know, his kids and everything that like he just couldn't, like imagine them taking these very personal things and like turning it into other characters and it makes sense like percy and annabeth are based off of him and his wife like he made all of this for his son like and so especially because of how long ago that was he was just like i just can't i just can't do this i just can't it's too weird and so now like obviously a lot of time has gone by and he talks shit about those movies for a long time (laughs) and now he's he like talked about when he got ready to do the show that that enough time had gone by and it was like when disney bought when disney bought warner brothers Mm -hmm. because that was what made this be possible which is so weird to think about is like disney bought warner brothers and so that's the people that had this movie and so once they bought that then he could get them to have disney come out with the tv show mm-hmm. and he like they already put out my books and so i think that this would actually work better and it's like that was a good idea sir <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah well so right off the bat the movie is a different tone because of logan lerman's age and that is kind of what i think sets the pace because when you're dealing with a percy that seems to be, I mean, I don't remember if they actually say it in the first movie, but like 16-ish, because they drive cars. Like they have to be at least 16. Um, Then yeah, it ages up a lot of the problems where like one of the main obstacles in the books is how are these little schoolers getting across the United States? Because they have to go all the way from New York to Los Angeles. And you eliminate that problem right away when they can steal a car and drive it. Yeah, and it's also a thing of, like, the whole thing about Percy Jackson is that literal, like, little kids are being forced to do, like, these very adult things. It's, like, a very aggressive version of, like, parentification, basically. And so that's the whole point of the entire story is that, like, in, like, the Greek camp, like, getting to be 16, you're, like, old. Yeah. Like, like Luke in the first book is 19 and he is seen as like old mm-hmm. and so like you're seen as like elderly if you get if you get to like that age and so if you make a movie where instead it's not like the whole thing about it is like the Greek camp is literally like teaching them how to be child soldiers because they have to be they have to be yeah. that aggressive with it because they have no other choice If you make them 16, then they're already like so much older and it takes away like the whole point of it all. Like it's much more aggressive watching like the little like 13 year olds run away from like these huge monsters and all this stuff in the show because it's just more a stark point when they're actually little kids. Mm -hmm. And so like right from the start, it's like, well, Percy Jackson is supposed to be a story about kids that don't fit in that are neurodivergent in many ways that have to go to this camp and are forced to like do things way too young because of their parents abandoning them. And now it's like, I'm not even sure that they even talk about the fact that they're neurodivergent. And then on like he, I think Percy makes like a quip about nobody likes me because I have dyslexia and ADHD or something like that. Oh my God. That's just like such like a simplistic way to put it. That's like, that's not, that's not, it's not like we walk around with like that stapled on our heads that I have dyslexia or something. And that's why nobody like it's, but like, it's, they don't really talk about it that much or like show anything having to do with that. Like any the visual effects of like the words changing to Greek. Yeah. yeah. 
and it's like and and then on top of it they're not like kids they're being forced to do adult things before they should they're older and like logan lerman looks like visibly older and stuff and so it's just as like right away just from that it's like what is the point of calling this percy jackson Mm -hmm. if you're not if you're not going to do that, if you're going to like take away the things that are just like the bare bones part of the story mm-hmm. then take it away. <laughs> yeah. And it it's very clear why they did that to me at least. And it's like, once they figured out their casting, it seems like they were like, how do we inject some sexuality and some like, I don't know, a little bit more adult humor in this, I guess. And that's what they went full blast for. So yeah, our version of a satyr in this one, yes, it's accurate to Greek mythology, but they made Grover just like mindlessly horny. And that feels so weird for Grover. There's this account on here. I think I follow them. I'm not 100% sure if I do. I might have been picturing somebody else. Mm-hmm. But there's this account on here that was like posting all of the original like scripts and i was just like what the <laughs> he's even worse in in the like original scripts before they changed it and i remember like when the tv show was airing and like right when it like finished airing i think i saw <laughs> saw this video by somebody who i followed already and i was like this is just so perfect where he was like he was like pretending to be like the writers for the original percy jackson movies and he's like, we're gonna make Grover black, you know, to like, you know, to be different, to break some stereotypes. And they're like, oh, that's cool. And they're like, actually, we're gonna make him like super fucking horny for no reason and really play into like the worst stereotypes about people of color. And and then also like leave him behind in the underworld. <laughs> and just be like, bye, we don't care about you. <laughs> and it's like, why would you do that? out of everything to do especially in 2010 like you cast somebody who's a person of color in a major role and then you make them like the comic relief in like an offensive way and it's just like why was that necessary yeah i i know for myself at least like when they announced that casting because it was it was already a thing you know back then that like oh they're casting a black grover um I remember being like, I could give a black Grover a chance. Like literally nothing about the red hair or freckles or whatever they gave him that, you know, like almost feels Ron Weasley-ish. None of that is necessary to who he is as a person. And so I was always open to it. But yeah, like the way that they changed his character, it's definitely more adult. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's, it's weird. It's a strange choice. And it just... It, the scene that kills me with Grover every time is when they're at Medusa's mm-hmm. and you think of like the TV show and how they have this like really like emotional moment where Grover sees his uncle that is dead there and he's all sad and they come up to him and they comfort him and they're like, I'm really sorry this happened to you. Da, da, da. The like movie version, he's like, oh, that looks like my uncle and he just moves on and leaves. <laughs> It's like he doesn't yeah. even realize that it is his uncle. He doesn't even seem to care. He's just like, oh, that looks like my dead relative that disappeared many years ago. I'm just going to leave now. Yeah. And it's just like, you don't care? You don't care about your family? Like, what is going on? <laughs> yeah, there's so little regard for Uncle Ferdinand in that. It was just like, it was. you can tell that they, what they were trying to do with the whole, like, oh, that looks just like my Uncle Ferdinand. He has, even has the same mole, and you can tell there's like a little bump on the forehead and then he's like oh yeah but he was killed by and then he moves straight to oh shoot medusa's here with no emotions at all about you know like what essentially ends up being the next plot which i mean it doesn't matter to them as much seeing as they don't build up the whole seeker grover is missing plot in the second movie to begin with but yeah i he does get separated from the group but I haven't watched the full thing yet. So the way he gets separated is different. Um, the thing that me about Grover too is how when Percy wakes up at camp and he, Logan Lerman is a good actor. Can I just say, can I just say that before saying this? Like I wa- I haven't actually watched, this is gonna sound so strange. I haven't actually watched Perks of Being a Wallflower, like the movie, 
because I will get like so triggered that I'll go into like some other stratosphere. So I've never actually watched it. Um, it's a really great movie. I know that it is. I've seen like some of the scenes of him being Charlie and Perks of being a wallflower. And I know that he, it's like a weird, it became like a weird meme. There's like this weird meme of the scenes when Charlie's having a mental breakdown because he remembered his sexual abuse. And it turned into like a meme of like Logan Lerman like crying from that movie. And so I know that he's a really good actor and I'm like, well, I don't know what happened with this movie specifically, <laughs> what like Christopher Columbus did to you because the scene when he wakes up at camp, he sounds like he's talking about like his cat got out and he can't find it anywhere. Not even that, it's like, I can't find my favorite pair of socks. And it's like, your mother just died. <laughs> like, And it really doesn't help that we have like, I have like the TV show in my mind. Like, so I have like the scene where Walker starts crying during that scene when he's not actually supposed to. He just does it because he's a child and thinking about what he would feel like if his mom died. And so he's, it's like that scene in the TV show is so good because he's so emotionally, so up, like you would be if you just saw your mom die in front of you or you think that you did. You would yeah. be really upset. You have no idea what's going on. And Grover is like, here, I got you like this reward. And he's like, I don't fucking care. Like, and I like the TV show version. I liked how he was like, I don't want to talk to you. Go away. Like, go. Goodbye. Like, I don't, I think my mom just died. I don't want to, I don't care. I don't care about anything. Mm -hmm. And the movie version, they're like, oh, that's too bad. Anyway, <laughs> like, let's let's go out, outside so Clarice can beat you up. And Annabeth can, like, stare at you, like, in a really weird, intense way for no reason for a good part of this movie. <laughs> well, yeah, they. I mean, they even skip the Clarice by making Annabeth the person who he's up against in <laughs> Capture the Flag, which... I mean, that's that's an interesting choice. I won't say it's a bad or good one because I feel like it it does let the tension between them play out a little bit quicker, which like in a movie, yeah, you need to do. Um, and Clarice isn't necessarily a necessary character to the first book. I mean, that is kind of true, but it was, it was so weird to have it be them up against each other like immediately. Yeah, and if you don't, the thing with Clarice in the first book is that if you don't give a fuck about, like, the greater storyline about Luke, then mm -hmm. you don't necessarily have to introduce her as a really good, like, fall person for Luke for the whole rest of the movie, because they don't really, they just kind of, like, throw that in there at the very end of, like, whoops, I'm actually super evil. Yeah. But the guy who plays Luke, it's... This is so funny. The guy who plays Luke in the movies played like, this was back when I watched Supernatural or like right when I stopped. Yeah, <laughs> like seven minutes or something. It's like, yeah. if, if he stretched it to, I think, I want to say something like three or four minutes is what you can actually survive with no oxygen to your brain. Like then it would be, you know, oh, this kid is a great swimmer. I wonder what that's about. Yeah. Um, but it's like, 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 minutes, it's like, what the hell are you superhuman? Like even in like the, the book version, they're like, huh. Um, the book version, he accidentally like drops in his entire class into like an aquar aquarium tank. And it's an obvious accident. And like he had even the thing that happens with like Nancy in the book, he accidentally basically like you can see that he's just like upset. Mm -hmm. and he's trying to protect his friend. And so he throws water at her, but he has no freaking clue what he's doing. And that's like enough of like a clue for you to get it if you know this world. But yeah. that's like that's like one of those, it's like the thing to compare it straight to like Harry Potter because it was the same stupid director. Like what happened to your brain during these two movies? Because the scene with Harry Potter where he accidentally lets like the snake out and he is like talking to him and he's like, what am I doing? That's kind of like a, like a good way to show that something weird is happening without mm -hmm. it being like overly aggressively obvious. Like, I'm sorry, if there is a child of any age that is able to sit at the bottom of the pool, just sit there for like seven minutes straight. That would, people would be taking him to like a hospital and be like, there must be something wrong with you. And I like, I say that because I always say I am like a Poseidon child. Like every test I ever took said that so far, but I also just knew that anyway, because 
when I was growing up, I loved swimming. My mom used to call me a fish all the time. And I would literally just like sit there. Like I remember times in the summer when it would be really hot out, like days like today, where it's like 90 degrees here and everyone is dying. I would just go into like whatever lake we lived by and I would just sit in the lake, like literally all day for like 10 hours. Yeah. And I would just like sit in there and like she would have to get me to come back out. <laughs> like yeah. my, my sister would come out because she would get cold. And I would just sit in there like literally all day long. I wouldn't have to play games. I wouldn't get bored. I would just like sit there because that's like the way that I would relax. And so I understand what you're going for, but that was a little bit too much because even when we really like swimming and we really like water, I could not hold my breath for longer than two minutes. I tried when I was growing up. That was the longest that I could do. And it like it just makes me think of those behind the scenes scenes with Walker actually doing that and it, that he had like nine people surrounding him and even him doing that would do it for like I don't know a minute and a half I think was like the longest and they would yeah. really be like shoving the regulator thing in his face being like we can't kill this child but that <laughs> <laughs> and like it, it this thing is so annoying like the movie the reason why i think this movie is so annoying especially because the tv show exists is because people who do that care so much about what they're doing like walker actually said that he was mad not mad but he wished that they would have done the scenes where he was underwater sooner instead of the very last scenes they filmed for the entire show i can just <laughs> imagine like the people who ran the show being like i'm terrified we're gonna hurt this child so let's do this last um, yeah. But he wished that they would have done it sooner because he felt like after he did those scenes that he understood Percy as a character better about what he went through and he was like disappointed that those were the very last scenes that he filmed for the next like year and a half because he was like I understand him better. And I was like this is ridiculous that this kid is like annoyed <laughs> about like waiting to film scenes underwater because he feels more connected to Percy while the movie version like, I don't even know who, like, I said this before, I, I don't know who Logan Lerman is playing. But it's not Percy. <laughs> it's not Percy. And, like, Annabeth is an Annabeth. Like, one of the funniest things about the second movie is that they make Annabeth dye her hair blonde. <laughs> like, that just fixes everything. She's suddenly Annabeth. That's the problem we had with your characterization was her hair color. Ugh. Yeah. <laughs> Like, when we talk about the era those came out in, Alexandra Daddario, 100% as an a choice, was so that we have pretty girl to push up front. Um, that, I mean, like, that's kind of the typecast that she's done. Um, well, actually, I haven't watched so much of her recently. She's one of those actresses, you know, where I, I think I've said this before, it's like a part of my neurodivergence. If someone plays a role too well, it'll make me hate them. So the one that she played a little too well for my comfort was on the show Parenthood, which has, you know, problematic depictions of autism. But that aside, I did enjoy that show. And um, in one of the seasons, she tries to seduce a married character. And for me, that was too much. That was like, no, no, I hate this girl. <laughs> um, and funny, funny thing about Parenthood, since we talked about like our personal nonsense um my sister and my mom loved that show <laughs> they, they thought that it was like super dramatic yeah. but they used to watch it all the time and they would like talk about it and they kept getting me to watch it and i was like no and they were like well you no, i won't try watching it i'm not gonna watch it this is stupid this is like over dramatic and weird i don't want to watch a show where people are constantly crying and being ridiculous no I, but i just think it's so funny that that's like the show that they both were like this is fun i i don't even want to know like how bad their autistic representation was because all our it was when we lived with my mom and all i remember seeing whenever they would be watching i would like my bed was like in my mom's living room and so if they were watching it i was like sort of watching it but not really i would just put on headphones and like watch something on my phone or my laptop or whatever and I can just remember looking up and every time I looked up, somebody would be like overly dramatically just like sobbing. And I would be like, can everyone relax? <laughs> like, you can't be this upset in every single episode. It's not, you would be exhausted. And this is me saying that it was a really traumatic life. And even I am like, can you calm down? <laughs> like, yeah. No, it's bad. 
Someone in my comments said that Annabeth becomes a damsel in distress in the second movie. Or do you want to? Do you yeah, want we're gonna to? watch them one next week. No, not too many spoilers for us. But um, I watched like I want to say the first thirty minutes ish, and I know <laughs> Shannon's gonna go crazy with the amount that they changed. So I'm waiting for her full on reaction <laughs> for that one because. It's wild. And yeah, to I, say that this one isn't wild compared to that one really puts yeah. it in perspective. Yeah, like, to just to, to, like, have, like, some frame of reference, this movie does not have Aries in it. Yeah. <laughs> like, Aries is not in this movie, and somehow the second movie changes things even more, despite the fact that they took out a huge character and like a huge plot point because they don't actually care about what happens in the in like the actual book it's just <laughs> i don't even i do know that when we were when we did our episodes we were talking about the chariot races i tried to look up the chariot races in sea of monsters to see if they did it and I found some like disgruntled reddit posts which are like they should be disgruntled because they're talking about these movies and they were saying that they did the chariot races, but they didn't like them for whatever reason. I couldn't find like a scene of it online, but I did find other scenes that were from the beginning that like, like the, when the both things like attacked them. And I was like, just from watching this without the sound on, they're already at camp when the bulls are there and they're already inside camp and everything and safe and stuff. And Grover is there, and I was like, excuse me? And then they do, like, this whole competition with, like, the 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 climbing wall. Yeah, that's... They change it in the strangest ways, like... That climbing... seems to be what they're replacing the initial chariot race with. Yeah. I don't know about towards the end if they actually do one, but in the beginning, they don't have it. They have that thing. Yeah, and like the climbing walls in the books like has like lava coming down it and stuff so it's like they didn't add that but instead just added like strange things to be in the way and at least that scene i can say that they were like attempting to be correct with percy's characterization where in that from what i saw that scene with the sound off it was percy trying to help clarice i think when she was falling off the the wall thing and then when she falls off of it, he he ends up falling off of it and doesn't win because mm -hmm. he's trying to help her. And I was like, well, that's at least like somewhat like that's actually in the general realm of Percy's characterization. So that's at least something, I guess. But then I saw the other scene where they're taking like the the Gray Sisters cab to like leave camp and go on the quest. And I'm just like you're yeah. leaving, like you're leaving with grover you're leaving from camp why do you need the cab to like take you anywhere when you're already at camp at camp <laughs> I was just yeah like, so the way they set that up it feels in character for mr d but okay let's let's focus on the first movie <laughs> so, um my my big thing with the first movie is our whole plot revolves around this the way that luke sets up the mission for them because they know that percy's mom is still alive in the underworld and they have no idea how to get to her so annabeth's like oh let's la ask it, a son of hermes and that's how they introduce luke and um you know i don't have a problem necessarily with a hermes kid being the computer gamer kid like that makes sense i know you made your argument about technology and how it gets outdated so fast in these depictions but honestly like technology fits for a hermes kid um that being said it does not fit for luke and having him be like oh everyone likes coming here because it's in the 21st century and like you know we're not living out in the ren fair out there i think he says something like that and um so that was a weird way to set it up right yeah but the setup for what they need to do because he tells them it's not so much getting into the underworld it's getting out that's the problem which is true canonically and in greek mythology mm -hmm. uh, is that they need to gather these pearls that are for Persephone's booty calls. Like, that is what these pearls are for. So they turned Persephone into this girl who just like, she just flirts around with whoever and wants any guy except for Hades because she's been trapped down there. Automatically, it's like, 
this is the weirdest thing I have ever seen done with the Hades Persephone myth. And so many rewrites have happened of that. And like, one, per Persephone should not be down there because it's the summertime. Mm -hmm. but she should be up here, not down there. So already from the start, that is strange. Even like people who don't know anything really, besides like the bare bones stuff that they remember from Greek mythology that they learned in school, they even know how Persephone's thing works, that she's up here in like the summer and spring and that she's down below. That's like why they say we have winter. And so just to start off that thing alone, you're like, wait a second, like that is like the bare bones of that myth and that doesn't make any sense. And then second, why is she like kind of sex trafficking people? <laughs> like I don't, like that's like low key sex trafficking. Like basically, like they're not, they're not getting paid, I guess. They're just having sex with her, but they're definitely in the underworld. That's really freaking weird. And it's also weird that these people that are supposed to be, they're not children, but still they're like under the age, of, they're all sitting there talking about how she just like has this whole thing set up to find like people to cheat on her husband with. And I'm like, this is so strange. <laughs> like, like, it's so overly weirdly sexual. And I guess that's like the thing with like Luke is that the Luke in the books is such like a huge betrayal moment because he's seen as like the nice guy that mm -hmm. people trust. He doesn't have like an attitude about him. Like he's cool to like Percy and stuff because he's older and he knows everyone at camp and he knows how everything works. And so it makes, and he makes him feel better when he can't figure out where he's supposed to be and all that kind of stuff. Like that's why his betrayal sucks so much later on is realizing that this person he thought was like a nice guy was setting him up. But like from the beginning, he's like being, he's playing, they're playing it like he's like the cool guy in like Dawson's Creek. Mm -hmm. Like he's like the cool edgy new guy at school who wears like a leather jacket and has like a poster for like the Ramones on their wall <laughs> and like all these like like I, I'm remembering like all the different characters from all those teen shows back in the day but that's basically what what he's acting like of like oh we're cooler than you guys are and it's like that's not if that's not like what Luke is supposed to be but also like Luke and Percy are kind of the same age so the entire thing of like how he looks up to him as like a mentor isn't there either so yeah, I'm like, yeah. I don't even know what to think about that <laughs> because none of that is, is like, right. Yeah, they set up no, uh, none of the emotional pull towards the betrayal later. I mean, like barely any. And because Luke is so flat and because he's got this attitude that's very apparent, it's very like, oh yeah, that makes sense. Um, I really want to wait for you to see it because they spoil something super early in the series that I'm pretty sure you said doesn't get spoiled until much later in the second one. Mm -hmm. But it's just like they don't have the lead up. They, they miss that. And some people say that that's the problem with the TV series, that not giving Grover enough lines about environmentalism or about, you know, like going to go find Pan was a misstep on his character or Annabeth not being obsessed with um, archeology span in the TV show was a misstep on her character. A misstep on a character is Luke seeming like a bad guy from the beginning. Yes. Like that's, I think one of the funniest things about a lot of the critiques from the show that I, that we don't like is that they, they tend to follow them up with saying positive things about the movie sometimes. And I'm just like, what is going on? Because, the movies are actually what do all the things that you think this show does. Like, they don't need to have, like, Annabeth doesn't need to go on a five-minute nonstop monologue about how much she loves architecture in order for you to get the idea across that Anna, that Athena does architecture and she loves architecture. You yeah. don't, it's a TV show. You don't need, like, you. it feels like overly hitting you over the head with something. If they tell you about it for longer than, like, a minute at a time, like, you don't, you don't need that like you don't need you don't need her to go on this huge rant about it they put in enough things that like go along with like the storyline so they like fit well and the way that they do with grover like it comes up in multiple episodes it comes up in like three or four episodes in a row about how he feels about nature and pan and and all that kind of stuff that's that's enough without like hitting you over the head with it making you feel like you're stupid like 
I guess that's like the main difference between besides everything else with like this movie is that and the show is that the show it can isn't like talking down to you like it is like you can figure this out even kids can figure this kids are not this stupid and so like kids can figure this stuff out they don't need to know every single tiny little detail yeah. and like, the movies are like what if i don't tell you any of the details tell you too much of the things that don't matter and then like mess up everyone's character and somehow it's so funny to me how a lot of people like the movies because they watched them when they were kids that's, that's, that's what it is, it is. i that's think is. a lot of these people that we're on reddit confused about are probably the people who watched the movie first as kids and then kind of reverse engineered movie to book and then suddenly are like wait a second but this isn't Logan, Logan Lerman and Ex Alexander Daddario and blah 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 you know like mm -hmm. that's what it feels like now after watching these because like for me at least Percy being sarcastic isn't necessarily the main feature of his character in well in the tv show in the way that it is in the books and the first movie because we're not getting narrated from his point of view. We get other points of view, which honestly just, it makes those like scenes where Percy is super sarcastic, extra funny. Like the scene where he makes one of the, the friendship song with Grover. Like, <laughs> yeah. Like seeing his face, seeing the look to Annabeth and like Annabeth making a face back. Like, try not to laugh. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and it's just, and giving Grover that look and Grover's like, I deserve this fine <laughs> like I did this to you this is my comeuppance yeah and I saw this um post on when I was just on Instagram the other day that I thought like kind of hit that whole thing over the like well that like without Percy's narration that you get in the books where he's being like making jokes and being sarcastic and making light of things he's just somebody who kind of sits there and doesn't talk that much because mm -hmm. all of the thinking is going on inside his head. And I'm like, yes, <laughs> correct. <laughs> that's that's why it's he comes off some sometimes different on the TV show, but that's because it's a TV show. <laughs> like that's that's what that means. Like, yeah, like one of the things I thought was kind of funny when the first trailer came out is some people were like, oh, Percy looks so sad in this. And I'm like, he is always stressed. His mom is gone. <laughs> yeah like he doesn't he he thinks at least for a good part of it that she's dead doesn't realize that she's actually alive and even then doesn't know if they're going to be able to save her like yeah he's really fucking stressed out <laughs> he's not actually having a good time and it was one of those things of like people just look back at the first book as this like happy-go-lucky book because it's the first one and things are a lot more simple in the first book of series like this, but he's not actually having a great time. <laughs> like he shouldn't be smiling. Like, I'm so glad I'm going on this quest with people that I don't know, that I've been told are gonna betray me and I'm gonna try to find my mom and I don't know if she's gonna be alive by the time I find her. This is so much fun. <laughs> like, no. They skip over all of that in the first movie. They don't even have him go see the Oracle until the second movie. And. <laughs> yeah so even, like luke like telling him like oh your mom's still alive and like i'm gonna help you go on this quest to go save her Ooh. but it really changes so much about like his whole thing with like the greek world because his whole thing in like the first book is that he doesn't know if he can trust anybody yeah. and he, in the book he like keeps it a secret that they that he was even told that somebody's gonna betray him and he's honestly not sure if they're going to help him when he gets to the underworld until they're basically there and so it happens faster in the show thankfully but like he doesn't know and it, so and that's the whole process that makes it a good story when you as the audience is like going along with this character in this world where you're kind of learning along with him like if you should trust these people or if you yeah. shouldn't and they like were just like i'm just gonna skip to the end and have him like not only tell you this huge thing that is supposed to be kept a secret from you you're also going to leave camp in this weird ass way that doesn't make sense um that's fine <laughs> I, I guess i guess it's fine um one thing about this movie that is that like defies everything is how they have all of these really good actors playing these side characters and i'm like what did they offer you to do this movie like how the hell is uma thurman 
Medusa. Okay, wait. So I want to back up a bit because remember the plot point is that the pearls are for booty calls. They're for Persephone <laughs> booty calls. Why does Medusa have one? Is it canon in this one that Medusa and Persephone have a thing? Because I can be on board with that. But like, you got to tell me. <laughs> Like, are they, are they like bi? Are they pan? Is there some like secret lesbian thing? Hap That's fine. Yeah. It's fine. That would be actually like wildly like progressive for a movie in 2010. Yeah. But it's just like, what is going on? <laughs> like, it's like an early, um, Ivy or, uh, what's her name? Poison Ivy and, uh, Harley Quinn kind of thing that they, yeah. like they could have done there. Um, because Uma Thurman is essentially... Her I or her poison I why do I want to keep saying Princess Ivy? Her poison Ivy like character. She's doing the same accent. She's doing the same like I'm a little bit seductive, but I'm not. So it really comes off as this is her revising Poison Ivy. <laughs> yeah. And that doesn't make sense for Medusa. No, it doesn't. And why was she in the cat suit? Like what she was in like a weird jumpsuit thing. <laughs> <laughs> and like, I just, oh my god i'm so glad that the tv show did medusa as like a survivor slash victim same thing just yeah. different words um instead of like that weird version of like why are you trying to seduce teenagers yeah like what is are you just do you just dress like that every day <laughs> like, this is supposed to be like a burger joint in the middle of the woods are you just like walking around like that all the time just like in case somebody happens to come in <laughs> so you can like entrap somebody into your into Persephone's like really weird sex trafficking <laughs> like situation that's going on here like I don't know why they created something like this for a movie that like it's, it's so weird too because I was like like I feel like such like a jerk saying this but not really because these movies are so stupid like and Rick Riordan hates them more than anyone else. And if he's mean to them, then we can be mean to everything about them <laughs> without like, without having to worry about anything. But it's just, I don't understand who were these movies meant for? Like who is supposed to watch them? Like who, like just from like a marketing perspective, who are you trying to get to watch these movies? Because Percy Jackson is something, especially the time that these movies came out, it would mostly be kids. Like I had never heard of these books until they, the movies came out because they were more, mostly for kids because they were such a new, they'd only been out for a couple years. And when yeah. this movie came out was when Harry Potter movies were still coming out and everything about so much of YA stuff was like totally eclipsed by Harry Potter stuff at that time, especially. And so it's like, are these meant for kids? If they are meant for kids, why do you have these really weird like sexual undertones in like everybody except for like two people and it's like it, and if they're not meant for kids and they're meant for like teenagers or like people in their 20s why is this movie so fucking weird because people that that age wouldn't like a lot of the stuff that are that is in this movie and would find it like imagine being like a 22 year old and like watching this like i was 25 when i watched this granted and like watching a movie where like the cool guy at camp is like, I have the cool video games like nobody else does. Like that is cool if you're 13. Yeah. That is not cool if you're in your 20s. So it's like, who do you even want to watch this movie? I'm honestly not even sure who like your target audience was supposed to be. So now my head just hurts. <laughs> I like just that's like the most basic thing about a movie is like, who do you want to watch this? You're assuming that you want people to watch it, right? You're making it. So like, who, who, who are you going for? I honestly have no idea. <laughs> yeah, and put in the movie. This <laughs> so criticism that you and I have both like, where are people gonna understand that she's Medusa or anything? She's, he's just like doing it. And he's like, oh, that worked. Well, this brings us back to a criticism that you and I have both like, where are people getting this from? Percy is too smart in the TV show. No, he's too <laughs> stupid in the movie. <laughs> he's, he's, they make him such like he. That scene is like the character I think of is like the like the jock dude in like the in like every teen thing I've ever watched. There's like a jock character that just accidentally like runs into things and makes stuff happen, and he doesn't even know what he's doing. That's like the way that they present Percy, and that's 
that's not Percy. He's an intelligent kid. That's why he gets through everything that he does because he is smart. And so it's so weird that people, it's so weird that people think that he's too smart in the show because they have him know things, but it's like, I, I don't know what, like, do you want him to be an idiot? Like, he's not an idiot though. Uh, I don't know what to say to that besides like, don't hate Percy. Yeah. Or whatever. I don't even know why that you would want him to be not that smart. Well, like, a another good example of how stupid movie Percy is, is, like, the Hydra thing, where he, like, oh yeah, I defeated the Hydra, because he cut off all of the heads. Like, even people who don't know a lot of Greek mythology <laughs> know that that is not how you kill a Hydra, you know? <laughs> yeah. Even, uh, like, when you said that, the, like, line that, that popped in my head from The Winter Soldier, the Marvel movie that has Hydra, the whole line that all the stupid Hydra people say is, like, if you cut off a head, another one just grows back in its place. I haven't watched that movie in, like, se six years. And I still <laughs> remember that line because they say it so much in yeah. that movie. And so it's, like, if people can know that in a Marvel movie where you don't need to explain what a Hydra is, and that people just know that about it. It's, it's like the whole thing with like Persephone being around and being in the underworld when she absolutely should not be. Like it should be winter then. And so it's like, what, what is going on here? <laughs> like I don't. It's just so strange. I, I just keep going back to thinking about how Ares isn't in this movie. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So how how the kids end up getting the bolt is. Luke gives them a very obvious shield, which like <laughs> that doesn't even fit in because the Percy in this one, one weapon he has is, you know, like um, Riptide, which is a pen. You know, it has a very convenient to hide, like misty type form. But when, when we have a shield that is like an arm thing that's huge, there is no way to hide that and make it seem like something mortal. Like Tyson and Sea of Monsters making the watch makes sense because like a watch just like all of a sudden turning into a shield, that's cool, you know? But this weird armband thing that Luke gives him that eventually ends up housing the lightning bolt just doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense at all. And also like Luke, like that is like the worst, like the worst plan because like what if he takes it off yeah <laughs> but like how it actually happens in like the books he gives the shoes to grover what if he like gives it to somebody else yeah <laughs> and then they have it and it's like oh i don't have it anymore guys <laughs> sorry <laughs> i just i don't even that's just so stupid is that like that's the only word i can think of to say about it like that that is just like the stupidest way to do that sort of story like it makes it not only does it make not only does it make Percy look stupid, it makes Annabeth look stupid, it makes Grover look stupid, and it makes Luke look really stupid. Mm -hmm. That that is like and also Kronos <laughs> and that whole thing too, because it's like by proxy, everyone looks really dumb. Yeah. And I'm just like, I don't know why you're making everyone in this world that is supposed to be intelligent, like really idiotic in order to make this this is like the silliest way to make this plan work like i know you did harry potter movies where everything is very simplistic and stupid but you can move on from that now. like you don't have to make percy jackson like that do you yeah so kind of getting back to the main plot so the second pearl was in that um that parthenon kind of like place who was supposed, like, w was she just going to sleep with what whatever random mortal or cleaning crew service happened to figure <laughs> out? Like, what is this thing on this statue? This doesn't look like marble. I don't know. I don't know why it's there. I don't know what's going on. This yeah. feels like a weird scavenger hunt. <laughs> like, the weirdest scavenger hunt of all time. Like... It's like a, it's like that those reality TV shows that I cannot watch, like Love Island, that everyone talks about, of yeah. like whoever finds the pearl first gets to sleep with the guest. It's just so strange. <laughs> Once again, are children supposed to be watching this movie? I'm not. I don't understand if they are supposed to be watching this movie. This, I mean, it's just so weird. I don't. I don't, and especially makes me laugh remembering that 
the Pearl thing was one of the things that people like lost their fucking shit over with the TV show that they changed. And mm-hmm. it was such a minor change that it was like really funny to see that like um, Rick Riordan, pretty one of the only reasons I'm still on like threads is that Rick Riordan is on threads <laughs> and he doesn't use Twitter anymore because of Elon Musk being the worst person alive. And so um, he posts, he was posting things on threads while the show was airing, like posting, you know, behind the scenes stuff or whatever. And like the week after the TV show did their episode about the casino, Mm -hmm. he posted something. And I remember seeing it and like laughing about how, even though I hadn't watched the show yet, because it was him saying like the change with the pearls is going to make sense i promise you they end up in the exact same place and it actually happens in a way that makes more sense once you see it and he was but he had to like post that because people were like so upset and literally all they changed is that percy had all four of them instead of three of them yeah the only thing they changed is that he had four instead of three and people were like extrapolating all this shit and being like they're not gonna that doesn't make sense because now they have enough to leave and but they're supposed to like decide who gets to stay and it's like oh wait wait until the next episode where a dog a giant dog eats one yeah like it's it's a better story and and honestly is like a better way to do that to have them feel like they have enough and then have it taken away from them in the middle of the underworld where they don't have time to come up with another plan it Mm -hmm. makes everything that happens a lot harder because especially because annabeth has to use one to leave that it's like they literally don't have enough to bring his mom home now and they don't have time to come up with a backup plan because they didn't it didn't even happen to them until they were already there that's Mm -hmm. a much more like dramatic good kind of story that like pushes all of their characters in a way that is much more interesting than them knowing from th- from the start that they don't have enough and yeah. just, like, deciding that they're going to go anyway and figure it out it just it just is better and but it's just so funny considering that how angry people got about that tiny like tiny little change that doesn't actually change anything and people still bring that up now as like something to be upset about when like this movie has them go on like the weirdest scavenger hunt of all time and nothing of it is ever explained why they're having to search for them in this way it's the weirdest thing ever and it's like from the beginning it's like they already know that they have to go to the underworld and so it's like this is so strange that people are fine with it being like this but with like the tv show making the tiniest little change they like lose their fucking shit yeah. And it, like nostalgia has to be like some sort of like a drug or something because it, I don't understand it, especially because some of the people that are the most like ridiculous about that are like older. They're not like kids, like the kids that are like starring in this watch these movies when they were little and they love all of them because they watch them when they were little. But they also acknowledge that their show is much more accurate. Yeah. Movies are. Um, and so it's like, if they can even under, like love the movies, but also know that their show is going to be nothing like them, it's just weird. Like, remember, this is like skipping ahead a little, but when they did like the, the, um, Lotus Casino thing, people like were upset that they didn't use like the Lady Gaga song because it was in the movie. movie. And, yeah. and Rick Riordan posted to say, I'm not using that song. I'm not doing anything from that movie ever. Like ever. Like um, one of the other things that's on thread that's Rick Riordan related is his like production company that's in chart. It's called like Mytho Magic, like the cards. Mm-hmm. And it's his production company for all the different. I don't like enemies to lovers as like a genre because I have trauma with anger. And so I don't like seeing people be angry at each other. I don't, un- I generally don't understand the idea that you could like be arguing with somebody where they seem like they're upset with you and then they, su- and suddenly they're like kissing you. That legitimately does not make any sense to my extremely traumatized brain. Like, thanks, dad. I can't, I can't see that. Like, it just doesn't make sense to me. And so, like, I never understand those sort of couples, but I can tell when they're supposed to be that and it pisses me off. And 
it doesn't make sense for Percy and Annabeth to be written like that because mm-hmm. that's not actually who they are. Like, like Rick Riordan's wife didn't hate his his existence. <laughs> like when they first started dating, like mm-hmm. or whatever. That it's just it's never that. Like it goes too far into making her be like openly mean to him or like ignoring him or whatever because like i said for the millionth time they write these characters like they're idiotic (laughs) yeah (laughs) i just like don't like it i like you don't the story between them was really good to start with even with them just in the first book it's a good story of realizing annabeth doesn't like him at first because of her mom and then realizing like oh i actually like this guy and like changing her mind about him by the time she gets to the end that's a good story that you don't need to turn them into like this weird enemies to lovers thing (laughs) well and even if you if you want to call the first book like the enemies to lovers section of their romance the Mm -hmm. tv show does a better job of that because i mean it's all the things that we talked about last podcast that people say against annabeth the, oh, she's too mean to Percy, she seems to be too rude, she has too much attitude. But that's actually what she's like in the books. And so it it makes more sense when we have an Annabeth who's just like, I don't know what to feel about this dude. And he kind of gets on my nerves at first. Mm-hmm. To mm-hmm. then jumping to, you know what, this guy actually, his moral upstanding is so good that I want to, I want to save him because that's where she eventually ends up in the tunnel of love scene. It's just, Mm -hmm. this guy would refuse to leave me behind and I already know that. So I am not leaving him behind. Yeah. Yeah. And like, that's why the like, Luke being like this like cool, bad boy just like throws everything off so much because Annabeth is like that with Percy, partly because of Luke and how Luke is. And so because you know and so like if you have luke being like this cool like like i don't know edgy like bad boy popular guy whatever um who's also the same age as percy which just like throws that whole thing off too but it's like why does she not like percy then because percy is so similar to luke yeah and it's like why doesn't she like him then the whole reason she doesn't like him in the books and the show is because he is very different from everybody else he's talking shit about he doesn't give a fuck about poseidon he's like get away from me i want my mom do you know where my mother is (laughs) and i don't care about anything else i don't care about anyone else i don't care about anything else i don't like any of you where is my mother the only person who's loved me my entire life and like that's all he cares about and that's why she doesn't like him because he isn't playing by any of the rules but Percy in like the movie, he's just like everybody else. He's not doing anything different that makes him stand out. So it's like, why doesn't she like him then? There's no actual reason for them not to get along because they're both edgy, moody little weirdos. (laughs) Well, and I think the way that they did the TV show also sets us up for stuff that wasn't in the books that they could add in that would make even more sense to that storyline because they didn't dive so much into the prophecy. I can't remember if they mentioned it at all even. And um, so they have room next season to say, oh, Annabeth knew about the prophecy. And not only did she know about it, but Luke was kind of in her ear saying, hey, Percy might be the prophecy kid. And what if he goes the wrong direction with it? You know, what if that's why she was so hesitant to trust Percy in the beginning is something Luke said about him being a prophecy kid. That would make so much sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and like they don't really bring up the prophecy stuff in the show. Like they talk, they introduce the idea of a prophecy Mm -hmm. and they introduce the fact that prophecies are always accurate by, you know, Percy literally going through their prophecy to Luke and showing how everything they said would happen did happen. Mm-hmm. And like when you know more about the sh- about the books and stuff, you can hear like Luke, like wanting to say that the prophecy won't be real because he doesn't want his own prophecies with his mom to be real. Yeah. But like they, but that's one of those things of like look, going like that's one of those scenes when people go back who haven't read the books, it will make more sense like later on. But mm-hmm. they don't say anything overtly like that because they don't have to yet. Like they, this next season will be when they can easily introduce the fact that there's some other prophecy about 
Percy that nobody will tell him about, especially because the last scene of him with, you know, his uh, fun little grandfather is his grandfather in his dreams. <laughs> I just like calling him his grandfather yeah, yeah. in his in his dreams, telling him that he has to survive, that his like survival is how he's going to win. And so that very easily sets up them expl somebody explaining the prophecy to him in the second season without them having to be outrageously clunky about it <laughs> and yeah. like every other thing that's ever been made that's tried like these movies that's tried to explain that whole thing to him. Yeah, exactly. Because I mean, they when they reveal what the prophecy is in the second movie, which I did see this part they have to age everything up automatically already. And that already feels like such a big change because I mean, it's a big point that making it to 16 as a demigod is impossible for a lot of these people. They're yeah. literally getting chased by monsters from the moment that they find out, so. Yeah, and like part of the whole thing with that prophecy and like how you feel about it is like one thing that was kind of sweet that like the Phantom at large did is when Walker turned 15, mm -hmm. like people were like posting photos that he had recently taken at like some magazine or whatever of him being a 15 year old. And people were posting them being like, oh my God, this is how old Percy is during the battle of, of like the last book, the last Olympian. And they're like, he was a fucking baby. Holy shit. <laughs> like, oh my God, that like, that's how old Percy was when he was doing all of the things that happen in that book, it's, it, there's so many things that happen in that book. It's so much. And so it just makes you see like how it made people sad, like thinking about somebody that young having to do all those things. And like, that's what you're supposed to feel. You're supposed to be upset that he's even having to do this stuff. Mm -hmm. That's the thing with like the movies is that they treat them like a, any other action movie where it's more like, oh, watch this like person do this really cool trick and how cool it is that they have these really big powers and stuff like that. And it's like, no, you're supposed to be upset that they even have to do this in the first place. Yeah. So like it, it, that's part of the whole thing that people don't like about the show too, is that the, the fights aren't that long. And it's like, yeah, because they don't care about any of the fights. Like it's upsetting that the fights are even happening. Like mm -hmm. the show version, it's upsetting that Ares is fighting a 12 year old yeah in in any way and he's excited to kill this 12 year old like that's upsetting that percy is having to fight a god when he was a 12 year old tiny little baby and his two friends have to sit there and just pray that he doesn't die and yeah. like that's the only thing they can do like it's horrible that it's happening in the first place that's why the fights aren't that long and so like when you take that away of from it you just like literally like suck the soul out of all of these characters and if you do that, then it's like every other stupid YA book that I ignored. Yeah. Why would anybody care about that anymore? Well, and speaking of sucking the whole soul out, we haven't even talked about this part of how they change the relationship with the parents immediately. So what we get in yeah. the, the exposition of the movie is Zeus put out some degree that nobody's allowed to talk with their children. And um, so Annabeth, they made her like this wistful, I mean, you see it in other tropes in movies where if a character is motherless, they're like, they're kind of masculine, but they pull towards feminine and they want to be feminine. And they're, anytime their mom gets mentioned, they have this wide eyed, like, oh, where's my mom? They yeah. give Annabeth that characteristic and that is not on brand. Nope. Yeah, and to, to make it this, well, their parents want to help them, their parents are in their ears, like, yeah, that's cool, and it that, that does feel somewhat canon of, like, you know, the parents silently giving that certain ones, at least, um, advice, um, but the idea that they would be great parents if they were just allowed, um, which is kind of the feeling you get, that doesn't fit, you know? No, that's, that's honestly, like, I don't mean to sound dramatic, but that's kind of like dangerous thinking to be like, oh, if I was just allowed to be your dad, I would be like, great at it, but I'm just not allowed to. So that's the reason why I am horrible to you. It's not no. that I'm a horrible dad. 
it's that I'm just not allowed to be the good dad that I could always be. Like, it reminds me of, honestly, what abusive people say to keep you around them. They say like, oh, I'm actually a good person. There's just things that are holding me back. And if I can just get over those things, then I'm going to be like a good partner or a good dad or a good whoever. But they like never actually do those things because they're an abusive fucking bitch. And so like that feels like like and it feels dangerous to me in the way that the movie is presenting this as like they're not presenting it in a way that like you should be upset at that at that at that the gods for saying that they're presenting it as like this is just factual like this is just the truth mm-hmm. so you can't you shouldn't be upset at Poseidon for never being there or the thing that was so weird about Poseidon was that they had him be there for the first like seven months or whatever arbitrary number they came up with of yeah. like Percy's life and then and then he like mysteriously had to leave because Zeus made that whole pact and it's just like a dangerous idea to just be like yeah this is just how it works and you're not allowed to be upset with me because it's like no that's not how humans work that's not how relationships work none of that is how that works like the whole thing with like the gods in the show and in the books is yeah Zeus does t- is mad at them and doesn't want them to be around their kids but why are you listening to him he's he's zeus who the fuck cares what zeus wants like yeah zeus is gonna get mad at you okay you're an immortal god i'm pretty sure that you could deal with talking to your child every once in a while and being around in your child's life and you could deal you could find ways to deal with your abusive ass like sibling or whoever he is to you when it comes to the gods it's a it's them skate, scapegoating themselves away from responsibility. It's very easy to just be like, oh, Zeus is the reason why I'm not around. And mm-hmm. it's like, yeah, but you're an immortal god. If you're not going to stand up to Zeus, then who the fuck is going to do it? And so that's the whole thing with that. Is like that's not a good enough reason. Yeah, movies are like, no, this is just the reason. Why? <laughs> I mean. So the lore of Percy Jackson, and I would say the lore in general with Greek mythology, is that there seems to be somewhat limited omniscience. Like, sometimes it seems like the gods know people's thoughts and what they're going to do before they do it, but other times it doesn't. And Percy Jackson leans into that a lot, where, like, they didn't know that Percy wasn't the lightning thief. Mm -hmm. They could have, you know, if they had full omniscience, they could have just been like, oh, yeah, the bolt isn't with this kid, it's with that kid but they don't have that so if they have limited omniscience then why would you just not sneak around to talk to your kid if you wanted to talk to them so bad because i'm telling you if someone was like you can't talk to your kid but there was a secret way i could do it i would i have thought about like starting a google doc for him when he's at school so that we have a place to talk because we can share one on the same thing but mm-hmm. I haven't done that quite yet. I, I'm not that crazy. <laughs> it's actually a good idea. Yeah. Like in general, if when school gets like vicious, if it if it does get vicious at all, I, I mean, um, that it would that that would be a good idea to like help a kid get through, especially middle school. Would that would be actually a good idea? Anyway, I'm yeah. gonna stop commenting on your parenting ideas that I think are good yeah. ideas now. But it is like a weird. It's weird that, like, Poseidon was there for all that time at all. And then because his brother told him no, he just, like, disappears into the night. Because I'm like, how bad of a dad are you if you just, like, disappear because your family tells you no? Like, that's so strange. Like, if my, if, like, as as bad as, like, a parent my mom was when I was young, if, like, some, if her dad showed up and was like, you can't talk to your daughter anymore, she would push him off of a cliff. Yeah. and would not actually listen to anything he had to say and so it it like it's just weird that that, that they make them so pathetic <laughs> and like also just like special effects wise it's very strange how the gods are like super tall gigantic yeah and i'm like this is so weird how do they like i there's way too much talk about sex in this movie how they have sex if With they're like yeah if they're that huge whatever and and then on top of it it's weird that poseidon is like moving like he's like also just i walking. actually thought visually that was kind of cool but it was like cool but i was also like this is so weird because poseidon is the god of water he is not 
water. <laughs> like he's not actually made of water. So actually, like, sometimes sometimes they will use like his name substitute substitutely for the sea in general. So I don't know. Like he's not literally water, but yeah. I saw one of those posts of like old Tumblr posts reposted on Instagram the other day that was like, so you know how Percy can heal himself with water? They're like, what about Hades kids? Does like Hazel ever just be like, wow, I feel really tired today. Let me just like burrow into some dirt because her powers are like finding like gems in like the earth. And that's like her like Hades power. And, oh my so, God. and so I'm just like imagining like Hades moving as like a giant like mound of dirt <laughs> or like zeus being like a giant lightning bolt that just goes <laughs> or something i don't know I, well i mean what they did with hades i we we didn't talk about this part they turned him into the devil and this is something that i i said in my own like underworld video on my tiktok channel is that when christians don't know what else to do with hades they will just default to oh that's satan right that's like greek mythology satan so we get this weird hades form where he is a giant like flaming demon thing and you know like the underworld yeah it's a little fiery but um you know it's mostly like a lake of lava fiery it's not like everything's on fire fiery <laughs> no like the whole like and the whole thing was like the greek mythology of the underworld is that there's different like levels like there is elysium there's the field of punishment exactly um, there's like asphodel there's like all these different areas so like yeah if you're in the field of punishment it would be like that because you're being punished for the rest of your stupid existence because you're a horrible human being but it doesn't all look like that and it's it's especially one of those things of like that stupid writer of the stupid movie and christopher columbus's dumbass like didn't actually even look up like a wick there's wikipedia back then they didn't actually look up wikipedia even of like percy jackson to know that like hades is not that that like hades in percy jackson is like the nicest one of the big three gods that doesn't want to deal with his family's bullshit and tries to stay away from it as much as he can he still does things that are shitty obviously Mm -hmm. it, he is much farther removed from everything else that like Poseidon and Zeus Poseidon and Zeus are like little bitches that are constantly fighting with each other over the stupidest shit and causing all of these problems and destruction he's like I don't want to deal with these people so I'm just going to hide here and like live my life with like my wife person who is apparently mm -hmm. sex trafficking people with pearls in this <laughs> in this movie <laughs> but it's like he's not actually bad it's just like I said, it's so lazy to just assume and not even check to make sure that Hades is just bad because obviously whoever's in the underworld is bad. And it's like, no, that's so stupid. Like you didn't, you don't even know any or remember anything from even just like Greek mythology that you learned in school. Yeah. If you think that Hades is that simplistic just because he's in the underworld, like that's just so dumb i just like i don't it's like nobody is that stupid i feel like they only did that so they could give persephone that line where she's like i'm already in hell um like it feels like they they did that just for the convenience of that line i read <laughs> i read this fan fiction once and i always mean to like screenshot it and send it to you but i always forget whenever i'm reading it and it's one where percy is in high school like his senior year and it's him talking to like other friends he has that doesn't know who he really is and they're learning about like greek mythology in class and he goes on this whole rant about about how hades isn't actually that bad and he calls the story that people say about persephone demeter like um propaganda <laughs> he's like that's demeter propaganda get that out of my face <laughs> oh my gosh i love and it i was like that's yeah that's perfect. That's exactly what that is. And this movie is just more Demeter propaganda. Like, stop it. Stop doing this, please. It's annoying. And they don't even, I don't, they don't have Demeter in this movie, do they? I don't think so. No, I mean, but the implied existence of her via the, the Hades Persephone part also just doesn't make sense. I mean, as a girly who is emotionally incestuous with my own mom, you know, 
I had my hypersexual phase. I totally did. But like, that's just off the rails because part of the reason why my hypersexual phase happened within monogamous relationships was because I don't think I could ever stand my mom knowing that I was like up to no good with multiple people, you know? Um, I, I joke about it that I still have Christian guilt even with my husband sometimes because of the programming of my mom. There is no way Demeter is just going to be okay with her daughter gallivanting around the underworld in that way. Well, yeah, and especially with you, like that would have been worse because of your stupid bitch ass grandmother. Mm -hmm. so yeah. I should like, slap in the face one day. I'm not, I'm not gonna slap your grandmother in the face. Oh my gosh. <laughs> it would just be really fun for me to do that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but like, even besides that, like in the context of this story, it's really weird, like, weirdly it makes sense for an emotional incest sort of thing to imagine a daughter running away from her mom and being willing to deal with being with somebody that she doesn't even like and then mm -hmm. having sex with like random dudes to like make one i'm pretty sure is when he posted the video like on his account saying like, I am so excited to tell you that Percy Jackson is being adapted into a TV show and that I am involved and it's going to come out on, like, Disney+. Plus. And it was when, like, Disney+, Plus was, like, a brand new... I remember seeing that and, like, crying because I was so happy that, he, that it was finally being done, like, correctly. Like, people were, like... Like, I saw it on, because of people on Twitter were, like, like having like breakdowns where they were just like crying because we were so relieved that it was finally happening and that he was involved and that it was finally going to be made the right way. But like, like imagine how bad like the TV, the, the movie version of these things have to be that like the dedicated fan base to these things start crying <laughs> when somebody says that they're finally going to make it the right way because it was such a horrible thing to watch it be made in such a horrible way and that that was the only i mean that that last movie sea of monsters came out in 2013 so it was like eight years of like nothing mm -hmm. and it, for i didn't think that it was ever going to happen yeah. like most people never thought it was going to happen and like there were rumors that it might happen when when disney started buying every uh, like all these different properties and stuff and mm -hmm. and we were like disney would be kind of the perfect company to do this but it was also like would rick want to do it anymore like he said that he didn't want to do this anymore and so when he suddenly out of nowhere said that like that's why the emotional response was so big because we were like oh my god it's finally actually happening um yeah but it is like an amazing thing to just remember like how happy people were that we finally like got our chance and how well it's going so far that it's so weird like watching the, this movie and without even trying to watch the next one and, and knowing that there are people out there who like the movies better it's like, so I, weird like nostalgia is like a thing but it's also like at one point you have to go back and watch these movies and realize that they're really bad if you didn't realize that when you were a kid like i'm sorry but if like walker school can know that like yes i love these movies i grew up like for him i grew up watching them because he's so young like he watched the first time he read percy jackson was in 2018. <laughs> oh my gosh that makes that, me feel so old like those there are like interviews going around when like the show first came out and it was in the interviews he was like oh i read them in i read them in third grade he like did the thing that we all do where he read like the first book and then read all 10 of them, read all 10 of them in the summer between like second and third grade or, or whatever oh when, he was, when he was like eight or nine one of those ages is when he read like all of them and and then like just kept going back and rereading them over and over again um as the years went on and so for him like when he was 13 and trying doing this show he had loved he had already read the book six times by the time he was 13 and loving something that much for like five years when you're only 13 is a is a long time to have something like that in your life. But it was absolutely wild to see when 
to see that clip going around and then reading the comments of people being like, that was 2018, by the way, when he was nine years old. And I was like, oh my God, oh my God. Yeah. Like that is just, oh my God, we are so old. <laughs> well, he was like either barely born or his mom was still pregnant when the movie came out. Yeah, he was literally like one. He was like one one year old when basically, when the when this movie came out, he was like four when Sea of Monsters came out. These were literally like the movies that he probably put on at home that he watched like a bazillion times that just made him happy. Like, I remember this one interview with him, he was saying when he was like nine or something, his parents like took them to um, the Louvre in like France. And he, because he was nine, he was like, why the hell, he doesn't say hell, but still like, why are we going on this trip to France just to go to a museum? And I was like, yeah, that doesn't seem like a good idea to bring like three small children all the way to France to go to a museum, what the hell? But he did say when he was there that the things that he enjoyed was seeing like the statues of all like the Greek gods that they have there. And that he was like telling people like facts about them because he read Percy Jackson. And he said he was like surprised that they didn't look like how they're described in like the Percy Jackson books and stuff. And I was like, yeah, because you are a literal like fucking child. And it's like adorable to hear him say stuff like that because of how young he was. Like, I get so annoyed when people are like, why didn't, why didn't he realize that Percy and Annabeth were going to be romantic when he first read the books? And I was like, because he was eight. Like, did you pick up on on romantic context when you were in second grade? I don't, like, I don't think you did. Just, like, uh, what else do you want him to do? He's like an eight or nine year old. Obviously, he's not going to pick up on that stuff when he's that young. It's like, that's such a weird thing that people say. And I'm like, he's a literal child. <laughs> Well, it's, I mean, I don't know what this experience was like for you as someone who is asexual, but like mm -hmm. growing up in the 90s and early 2000s, us millennials had sexuality, the idea of finding your soulmate or finding your person thrown in our faces in every single form of media. And Gen Alpha doesn't have it in that same way where there's not this intense pressure to find your romantic interest as young as possible. Um, you know, like the fact that William's 11 and hasn't had a single crush weirds me out sometimes when I really think about it. It's like, wait a second. I had like seven by the time I was his age, you know, but, um, it just, it feels like it's such a cultural difference in how they're brought up too. So even then, I don't know that he would have caught on to it because it's not the way that those kids think. Yeah. And thank, like, thank God, because... Yes. That was, that really sucked. Like, I used to think when I was younger, I would just think like, oh, I'm probably one day like gonna get married or something, even though I didn't want to. And of course, <laughs> like my circumstances were like extreme, but still like when I was like 13, I was like, I don't want to get married and I don't want to have any kids. And I would go to like my aunt's house in Chicago who didn't get married until she was 40 and never had any kids. And I would be like, oh yeah, I can just like live like her. But I was literally the only person that I knew of that even thought that or would say that. Like, so I wouldn't say that to people. Like, I remember once saying that to my dad when I was a teenager and him being like, oh, you'll change your mind when your friends start getting, like, getting married and having kids. And I'm like, I'm not going to bring children to the world because of peer pressure. Yeah. Like, but thanks for letting me know how that went for you. <laughs> like, I already know that it was a bad idea for you, but that just makes it even more clear. But like, just, and like my sister and like my mom and everyone else I ever met ever would always talk about this idea of like, well, obviously you're going to get like married and, or like be with somebody one day. Even like people recently have said stuff like, like that to me of like, oh yeah, you're obviously going to find somebody like that one day. And it's like, why? Like, why, why do I have to? Like, why is that like necessary in order for me to be happy? And so it really sucked when I was younger because everything was so aggressively romantic and I hated all of it for very valid reasons. And I didn't want it around. It was the most triggering shit in the entire world, seeing that and, and being told that I wouldn't be happy unless I did that. But I hated that and didn't want to have anything to do with it. 
at least now people finally know that there's like other options, even though people still like talk about it as if that's still the only option. Like part of the reason why I liked Harry Potter and why I liked these books is that there is, I guess, like romance, but in Harry Potter, it doesn't really happen for for real really until like the sixth book and i fucking hate that book um i never read it because it was so s stupid like him talking about having like a chess monster and stuff i was like i cannot re i'm embarrassed like looking at this book i cannot i never read it i never watched any of the movies even when i liked harry potter i like just refused to even look at it because it was just so silly and like with these books though like percy and annabeth are romantic or whatever and there's other romantic couples but it's 100 percent not like the focus of the story there's so many other things that are going on that are more important <laughs> that like that's a part of their characterization yeah but oh. it's not like the entire story in a way that like hunger games started off as like a book series about also territorial like overthrowing a government and that is generally what that those books are about i guess but there's also like this huge plot thing that happens with like Peta and Katniss that kind of overtakes everything in mm -hmm. like a weird way too. There's none of that like in these books. Like Percy would succeed the way that he does, even if him and Annabeth never got together. Yeah. And that's like the thing about it that I like is that yeah, they get together because they love each other, but they don't have it it's not like an integral plot point. You can ignore that whole thing and the story will still go the exact same way because they still love each other. Yeah. Um, even if it doesn't turn into something romantic at the end and like it does and it's fine and I like it, but it's not like, it's not super important in the way that a lot of those stories were. And so I could enjoy it better because it was like just awful. And I am hopeful that kids growing up now have media out there that is like more about just them as people and doesn't push the the idea of like if you find like your true love then everything in your life will magically be fixed because that is i don't think that's a very millennial story no it's not like and as a millennial who looked for that for that reason yeah it doesn't work like that i have a great partner i have a great husband he mm -hmm. is the type where i hope we never get divorced ever 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 but still he did not fix my life if anything I had like a mental downturn after finding him because it's like, okay, why am I still not happy? Like, you know, why is everything still not okay? What else is wrong? Which is actually how I started unpacking my childhood trauma. <laughs> you know, <laughs> Like, oh wait, oh wait, there's something else wrong with me, isn't there? <laughs> yeah. Do you ever like th think back to like the things you told yourself when you first went to therapy and you're like, what the fuck was wrong with me? <laughs> like, I remember in 2018 when I went to therapy, like that is, it's wild to think about when like baby, like eight, nine year old Walker was like a tiny little child reading Percy Jackson for the first time. I went to therapy and told myself that I was going to, because I was anxious. I didn't even say, I didn't even think that I was depressed when I first started going and like, three months in i was like oh my dad sexually abused me for over 10 years yeah. <laughs> it just accelerated so fast but it's just so funny to me to imagine the things that i told myself of why i was going to therapy i told myself that i would go for a couple months and just stop and i was just like that is so funny and i know that everybody is like that when you first go especially when it's like huge amounts of things you have to like start small or else you're never going to go because it feels like too much to be aware of everything that is going to come out of you once you actually start doing it. Wow. Um, but it is just so funny to remember that, that like, that's what I was doing in 2018 when he was a tiny baby reading Percy Jackson for the first time. Like, oh, my entire life fell apart <laughs> yeah. with like the span of like six months. And ironically, I was also reading Rick Riordan books then. That was when I read Blood of Olympus, was that year. I, I read Blood of Olympus when I was driving around doing DoorDash delivery driving when I lost my job because I was like too depressed to work. Oh, yeah. And so like, I was reading Rick Riordan books then. 
um which is just like f weird to think about that he was always like around yeah somehow <laughs> Yeah, Rick Riordan for me has always existed in the back of my head in the way that like, oh, someday you'll do something with your mythology stuff, you know, <laughs> like it was always an example of, well, here's somebody who did something with it. So um, that's how he always existed for me, even though I, I put down the books in like, what was it, 2010 and never picked them back up again until recently like that has always been in my mind of like okay but required in his goals <laughs> yeah you just had to wait like however long that would be to meet me <laughs> exactly. and have a reason to talk about this <laughs> and we just had to wait until the tv show came out for to give us an excuse i guess for doing this it's way more easy to talk about this stuff with a season of it out already instead of when we are all waiting for it i was just like i'm too anxious that this show won't be good because mm -hmm. I will be so sad if it once again isn't good so I just like didn't I paid attention to it like I saw all of the casting announcements I it was really fun seeing like the videos that I would see while people were watching it and they all like were very positive they're all like so excited like I saw so many videos of the tunnel of love scene Mm -hmm. of Percy in the chair and I was like what the hell is that because that that didn't happen in the books and I saw but I saw like so much of that that I knew that whatever that was was obviously really important and in and even still like when it actually when it actually happened on screen I was still very surprised because I just like wasn't thinking about it by the time I was watching it and then I was like oh no wonder why I saw 40 bazillion videos of yeah. Percy in this chair because he's slowly being suffocated to death when he's in it. No wonder why people were so upset by that. But I would see like things as things were going on that it was that everyone really loved it. Um, mm -hmm. So it was just literally like the day that the last episode came out, I was like, OK, now I can finally watch all of this because I need to know how much I'm going to like it because I keep seeing videos of people really liking it. Yeah. And and then I was like, oh, well, no wonder why people really like this. <laughs> well, to kind of end this on a positive note, because I have to go pick up Jake soon. Um, mm -hmm. Well, we found out recently, Kids Choice Award. So Walker won Best Male Actor, right? And then the show won Favorite TV Show. Mm -hmm. And that just proves how how great this is because i mean people could talk about these kids performances all they want no kids care as much <laughs> about the source material what they are acting in as these kids plus these kids are just great actors already you know yeah, yeah and like when i when i logged on to like disney plus again today it was one of like the, a picture of percy was like one of the shows in the background that they were using to like promote the app and i was like oh okay and but Beyond that, too, the big like news that came out this week is that they're going to be in Hall H of mm -hmm. Comic Con, which is a huge deal. Like Hall H is the biggest room of Comic Con. Like thousands of people sit in there, and I'm like, you are, you are, they are 100 percent announcing who the cast is during that panel. And yeah. I'm like, I'm not even waiting for it to. Ha it's going to happen during that panel because that's the, usually for Hall H stuff. They'll like show like scenes of like a movie or a tv show or whatever it is like before and like the people who watch it aren't allowed to like record it and the people always like describe what they saw later on but there's usually something big like that that they are is like a um something that you only get to see and only get to know in person if mm -hmm. you like go to the panel and like i'm like you're gonna that is wild that this show is big enough that Disney is putting it into Hall H. Like, that's where, like, Marvel is going to have a panel in Hall H, like, two days after they do. And I was like, wow, our kids are cool. Like, because yeah. that room is, like, gigantic. And so I was like, that's exciting to know that they are so, like, into this show that they're they're going to announce the cat, the new cast members during a panel during Comic-Con when there's going to be so many people, like, journalists and all that everywhere there during the panel and it's and i don't think there's anything huge ha like the marvel stuff doesn't happen to for another day and so that news will like um you know be like the news going around everywhere for for at least a couple days and then they're also doing a panel at like a d23 event that, like a week like two weeks later in like the 
on like August 10th. Yeah. Like an event that Disney does to like get people to sign up for their D23 thing because it's, I guess, like a paid thing. Okay. Um, and that's the thing where they're like, you can like go to the set if you like win. One of the things that you could get if you win like their thing is going to the Percy Jackson set. But either way, I was like, wow, okay, they really like this show because they're having the kids promote Disney by showing up at two different panels, like really close. It's really cool. That's it's but Comic Con is such a big deal. Yeah, in the world is at Comic Con, like when it comes to like promotional things, like. So I was like, wow, that's crazy that our like show is gonna get have that much attention on it in in a great way. Yeah, and D twenty three is where they announced the cast last time they announced cast. So. <laughs> Um, like we know it's going to happen, even if it doesn't somehow happen at Comic-Con, D23 being two weeks later, it, we know that that's when the news is going to hit. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, because we also know filming isn't supposed to take place until further after mm -hmm. that, they're not going to have any clips to show, except mm -hmm. maybe somebody's audition, but I don't know. Yeah, that's why I think at Comic-Con that they're going to just, <laughs> I'm sorry. Sorry, like Thalia, like fans. I have a, re I'm, I have a valid reason, even if you don't agree. There's a reason yeah. for it. I swear. <laughs> yeah, we'll get there. So, um, for the next few episodes, because we wanted to do an episode on grooming specifically, because there is a cast member who has started or has had rumors about them. So yeah. I, I know I want to do a little more research before that. Yeah. And um, we can also frame it because the, sh I mean, Luke's character is literally a groomer. <laughs> so um, there's there's ways to talk about other stuff too, since there's not a ton out about the actual cast member. And then we can watch Sea of Monsters, and then we can move on to Titan's Curse. I don't want to move on to Titan's Curse too fast because it's going to be so long before the third season of the show okay. is even like a twinkle in Rick's eye. <laughs> You know, yeah, that's fine. And if something comes up between then and now, we can talk about something else. Yeah, um, but I have to go because I have to go pick up Jake since I have the. <laughs>